Welcome to Run It Back on the Raptors Republic Network. I'm your host, Zofi Shake, joined here by Kyle Ramner Ryan, as always. And I know it's been a while, but hear us out. Since we last spoke, Toronto has played just six games, so we figured a bit more time would give us more to chat about. I think we were right. So we're going to have to recap a lot more action now, talk about some of the things heading into the trade deadline, and also go into our power rankings like usual and then looking ahead to next week. So with that being said, let's run it back. All right, let's take a look at the last two weeks of Raptors basketball. And as you can see, not a ton of Ws, but a lot of action nonetheless. Two weeks ago, the Raptors took on Memphis, LA, and Atlanta. Unfortunately, no wins there. They started things off by losing to a skeleton crew. Grizzlies were missing Sean Moran, Desmond Payne, and Marcus Smart, among others. But Triple J and the Youngins were enough to get a dub. Jaron Jackson Jr. finished with 27 and a career-high 60 steals, all of which came in the first quarter, which says a lot about what the Raptors were doing in that game. And the Grizz won 108 to 100. After that, the Clippers game was basically, uh, there's levels to this type of thing, as the Raptors just couldn't keep up with the talent of LA. PG, Russ, and Harden each finished with over 20 points. And even though there was no Zubats for the Clips, they still got to work down the lane, scoring 70 points in the paint. Harden was masterful, just forcing Toronto to play how he wanted as the system, not a system player, finishing with 22 points, 10 rebounds, and 13 assists, his 75th career triple-double. Now, the Hawks game, despite another L for the Raps, was a fun one. We got our first Jordan War performance, and he was honestly awesome, finishing with 24 points, 9 rebounds, and 6 assists off the bench. You don't really get to say that often in Toronto these days, but despite the other guys stepping up, it was also clear that Toronto was missing their key guys as they were without Quick, RJ, and Yak, and especially missing their center as Clint Capella was dominant inside the paint. 19 points, 14 rebounds, the Raptors were a minus 24 on paint points, and still, the Raptors showed no quit and kept in it, and even took a one-point lead in the final 10 seconds when Trey Young turned the ball over. Grady Dick found it and tossed it ahead for a Scotty Barnes slam dunk. Barnes liked it so much, he even rewarded the rookie with a forehead kiss. That was pretty wholesome. But like it cost him all night, the lack of a big bit him in the end. Young drove for a look at the rim, and despite missing, Sadiq Bey put it back, climbing over everyone else. And that was all she wrote. 126 to 125 for Atlanta. Tough way to lose. Now that brings us to this week, and it begins with the Raps picking up their only win during this stretch and doing it against the Chicago Bulls. Now if you wanted a game where the quote-unquote others stepped up, this was it, folks. Still no IQ, RJ, or Yak, but no problem as GTJ stepped up for a season high 24 points. 13 of those came in the first quarter alone. Wara added 17, going 4-5 to five from deep. And four of the five starters finished with 15 or more as they snapped their losing skid and took a 118 to 107 win. It was pretty smooth sailing all the way through, so that's what you like to see sometimes from this Raptors team. And now that brings us to Houston, and finally the return of Jakob Pertl and Emmanuel quickly. It was good to see them back, but unfortunately the jolt of energy you were hoping for just never came. Nothing was going to help Toronto's forest defense as they were basically like pylons out there for the Rockets to go around. Houston finished with 84 points in the paint, tied for the most in a game by any NBA team this season. Alperen Sengun and Cam Whitmore led the way with 24 and 25 points, and it legit just felt like bullying by the Rockets, as the Raptors did nothing to match their physicality and got dominated at the rim, on the glass, and in the paint. Now, the only Raptor to show any fight or physicality inside was Scotty Barnes. He looked awesome as he got downhill as much as he could, and when he wasn't trying to score by attacking at the basket, he was trying to dish it out and kick passes out, but unfortunately, no one was really knocking him down. Barnes finished with a game-high 28 points, but still a major L for the Raptors, 135-106. to 106. Now that brings us to Sunday night, and the Raptors taking on Canadians SGA and Lou Dort and their Oklahoma City Thunder. And Toronto looked awesome early on. Like, really awesome. For all the lack of basical defense we saw against Houston, they were equally, if not more, locked in to start this one. The Raptors held OKC to just 20 points in the paint in the first half and were running around like maniacs on defense. Their rotations were crisp, everyone was getting involved offensively, and the result was a big lead against the number one seed in the West. The Raptors were up by as many as 23 points, but things did start to take a turn in the third quarter. Whether it was fatigue or just a lack of execution, Toronto's defense began buckling. As the closeouts weren't as sharp, the penetration for OKC got easier, and the Thunder just began knocking down shot after shot from distance. Aaron Wiggins hit a pair of triples that made it a single-digit ball game, and it started to get really dicey for Toronto in that third quarter. So dicey that it ended up taking two extra overtimes for this game to be decided. Toronto had two opportunities at the end of regulation and at the end of overtime to win, but neither attempt really got anywhere and double OT came and they just simply ran out of gas. Now it was awesome games for IQ who had 17 points and 11 assists, and RJ Barrett in his return from injury reminding people what they missed, with 24 points just bullying his way to the rim. 
Now, Scotty finished with 19, 7, and 9, a pretty good statistical game, but he was really quiet towards the end there down the stretch, taking just one shot after the three minute mark of the fourth quarter. And that shot was an air ball in double overtime from the three point line. So the Raptors end up finishing the last two weeks one and five. They're now 17 and 32 overall and still sit in 12th in the East. Now, Kyle, I know there was a lot to go over there, but I want to kind of take it back to the end of that game against Oklahoma. A lot of talk has been made about Scotty's performance near the end of that game, the assertiveness or the lack thereof down the stretch. I'm kind of curious what your thoughts and impressions were from Scotty and the kind of the conversations going around about him right now. Mm -hmm. You know, like I've been I've been seeing so many different takes, you know, it's I saw one where it's like, oh, he played 50 minutes and he's guarding the best player. You know, he's probably tired or he didn't get the ball at the end of regulation. So like he's kind of being more passive or he should have just drove it for me, at least. I think at that point, if you're at the end of um, at the end of the first OT and you have the ball, regardless if you did get the ball or not at the end of regulation, whatever happened, happened, you know, you are still kind of the face of this team. You are the star of this team drive the ball you got to do something you got to make something start happening you can't throw the grenade into gary Trent jr's hands as soon as i saw that play i was just like okay this was just a kind of a waste of a possession for the raptors because nothing was moving nothing was happening like he didn't start dribbling or nothing as soon as he passed it off to gary Trent jr i was like all right this is wraps for me i think he should have been more aggressive yes you did play a huge ton of minutes still but they're trusting you in that moment you have the ball in your hands in that moment all the raptors fans are looking at you like okay you are the guy you need to be able to do something here at least go for a two not a three you know like we need the win here this would be a huge win for us we just blew our huge our huge lead and we're fighting for our lives out here and then you do this and i don't know if it was other people saying but like his body energy just kind of like his body language just kind of looked off like kind of deflated again i don't know i wrote that in my quick reaction i don't know if it's the minutes he played i don't know if he was frustrated with the team frustrated with his own performance i saw clips of him storming off at the end of the game obviously i'm just going to chalk that up to him being frustrated with himself and not like what happened with the team during the game but for me at least i think i don't think darko even needs to tell him either like you need to be aggressive in that instance because like our coach shouldn't be telling our star player you got to be aggressive in the clutch like scotty should already kind of know that but what, what did you think i was going to ask you about this too like did you think he should have drove that or what do you think the Raptors should have done in those kind of final seconds? Uh, I like that you ended it with what do I think the Raptors should have done? Because I don't think this is a Scotty Barnes singular mm -hmm. issue. I think this is a team needing to figure out how to use their players best in these crunch time situations. Yes, we want Scotty Barnes to be assertive. I'm with everyone there that Scotty Barnes needs to kind of show an aggressiveness there. But it's how do you set him up to be aggressive and confident is where I'm I'm kind of like having a gripe with a little bit of this conversation right now. When Scotty Barnes got that ball at the end there, he was like behind the three-point line facing the basket. And do people remember who was standing in front of him? Lou Dort, one of the best defenders in the NBA, one of the best perimeter defenders. He's very strong. Maybe one of the few people as strong as Scotty Barnes. Asking Scotty to kind of dribble his way through that and figure something out, I think is really hard with the amount of time that was left there and kind of like after they set up this play, he wasn't in motion. He wasn't kind of put into the post or in a, in a spot where he can really create how he wants to. And I think that's something this coaching staff needs to learn. That if you're if the goal is getting Scotty Barnes to look for his own shot in a lot of these like crunch, crunch time situations, and that's a developmental thing that you want to accomplish, which most of us probably think that is what this coaching staff wants to do. Well, then start by putting him in an advantageous situation. This is kind of where I'm at. If the goal is to kind of look for the best opportunity, then sure, you can put Scotty Barnes in a situation like that. But then you need a lot more movement, like you were saying, Kyle, where like mm -hmm. things have to be happening around him for him to read and react and not just stand still like plays like. There's very few people in the league that are good enough to just get the ball standing still and make something happen, especially with a defender like Lou Dort on them. And Scotty Barnes isn't there yet, and nor do I think he should be at the as a 22-year-old trying to figure it out. So for me, it's one of those things where, like, if you do want him to be that guy and to have that assertiveness, you have to start by giving him the confidence to be working in a situation where he feels like he can do it. And I don't think when Scotty Barnes got that ball there in that situation, he looked and saw that I can get much out of the situation. He is not an elite dribbler yet. He has a huge frame and size. He's not the fastest because of that. So asking him to kind of go make something happen in that situation, giving the time that was there, I think it's really hard and it's not totally mm -hmm. fair. So I, yeah, sure, be assertive, but a step back three or like moving side to side against Luke Dort isn't really going to accomplish you much. And a guy who does know how to dribble and create is Gary Trent Jr. So yeah, I understood Scotty threw him a live grenade at the end there, but he wasn't put in a position to really do much himself. I don't think it's as simple as like, hey, take the ball and run down the floor against one of the best defenders in the NBA. So I think they, the team itself needs to figure out mm -hmm. more how to get everyone involved. 
and i know like i know a lot of people kind of quickly kind of turn on scotty after this game no pun intended but like it's it, it's kind of it's kind of weird that we're doing this again like you said he is 22 years old this is only his third le- third year in the league like are we forgetting that kobe didn't airball two shots in the clutch one time that one time like this happens these are the growing pains you learn from this and you get better i saw scotty close out a whole game against the spurs earlier this season yeah. so i know he can do it i know he can do it that's why i'm not getting on like getting like griping on him too hard or coming down on him because again he will learn these things he will learn how to make something happen there or have run a good play to get him where he needs to be or switch on to different defenders or anything like that. This is what comes with a young core team right now. Again, like you said, two wins and losses. Like, yeah, that was a tough loss to eat, but you know, we'll learn going forward. This is how the team learns. And as Raptors fans, you have to stand by Scotty. We can't just abandon him when things like this happen or be like, oh, he's not the number one option on this team. I saw a few tweets saying that or he can't close for this team or RJ is now the guy of the Raptors. Like you were turning on him so fast and we have to stand by him because things like this are going to happen with a 22 year old. Like he we are putting so much expectations on him and so much pressure on him to be successful now but the whole point of having a young core and the whole point of going in this direction is to learn and to grow and develop and this is what it means tough losses like this will happen but we have to see the positives in these losses and what happened like i'm taking away the whole first half whole, whole first half defense that game that was got me really excited for the future the way the raptors were able to lock lock down everyone was moving with energy everyone was getting back on defense everyone just we kept moving the offense was flowing that is what gets me excited for the future of this team yes the second half was kind of a letdown and they seemed like they were gassed out but you know i'm not going to get on top of them for that because i'm not expecting these guys to contend come april yeah like i think what i want to emphasize is the fact that like it's been mentioned before development isn't linear and part of that this whole wins and lessons mode it, it isn't just like oh they had a really good game at uh, this time out like oh Emmanuel quickly looked awesome down the stretch so that's development because we're going to try to build on that yes that is part of development but development is also the other side when you have a bad stretch how do you learn from that how do you adjust from that scotty barnes wasn't so assertive down the stretch here and that's something that not just he has to learn from but his coaching staff has to have to learn from how are we going to use scotty better in these situations scotty has to think how can i be more effective in these situations where can I be like doing more for my team down the stretch? So yes, it's not positive because he had a bad outing down the stretch there. Even though his numbers were great, he didn't look so assertive down, uh, in crunch time, but he can also develop off that. He can learn. So development isn't just, this is positive, let's build on it. It's also, this was negative. How do we kind of like build away from that? How do we change those habits? So I think both side of, uh, sides of it are important. And you kind of brought it up earlier. I wanted to ask you about it. This whole like, this conversation around like, Scotty can't be that guy. He's not a 1A, RJ Barrett is, or quickly is. I see a lot of fans trying to create this hierarchy amongst the core mm-hmm. and how like there has to be a one, two, and three. And I'll get to my thoughts on that in a second. But I'm curious what you think in terms of like roster building and development. Is that how this team should be built in terms of like Scotty has to be number one A or he has to be the top guy and you kind of build around that? Or do you see this more as like a, a core of players that need to be brought up? I think it's probably just a core of players that need to be brought up. Like, yes, Scotty is our kind of core franchise piece but right now as we're developing this team like kind of just doing rj should be first or quickly should be first scott you just be first it only creates division amongst the teams it only creates this guy needs to have this ball when this is going to happen or rj's taking over or this guy's not the number one it's they're still growing together it's only been a few months of this team really working out and the trade deadline is just around the corner we might get even more changes to this team so to be talking about like oh this should be how the team works definitively is kind of crazy because we don't know if bruce brown is going to stay we don't know how this team is going to work we don't know if we're getting how many different players or what messiah is cooking right now if gary trent might get traded if dennis might get traded like we don't know what this team is going to look like a, a month from now so to say like this is how we should be organizing is kind of ridiculous for me ridiculous to me i think we should be focusing on them as a core and growing them together as a core building that chemistry, learning each other's games, learning what plays to run. I think it was uh, when we were talking about Marcus Gasol or the rap show was talking about Marcus Gasol retired. They're saying Kawhi would just not, or he would just nod to Kawhi and Kawhi would know to get that the backdoor cut. Things like this can happen once that chemistry starts flowing. Once they play long enough together, they don't even need to say it. They will just know what to do. So again, I feel like some Raptors fans might be taking this out of proportion, but this is what comes when you are building a young core team things like this will develop tendencies will develop we can't just be singling out players from other from other players because you want to build this core five or this core three right now 
Yeah, I'm with you. I think this idea of like it's a one, two, three doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Yes, Scotty was a fourth overall pick. Yes, he was brought in to be the face of the franchise. But the face of the franchise very seldomly means that it's you above everyone else. Mm-hmm. There's not a lot of situations in the NBA where that's happened. Like a LeBron James is an example, but even he had complimentary pieces with him in his most successful ten years. Uh, like a Michael Jordan, obviously, but even he had a Scotty Pippen. Like there's not many examples of a guy who's just like you are the star, you are clear cut number one, and everyone else falls in line on your team. It's been a lot more situations of like a 1A, 1B, 1C type of thing. And that's how I see this Toronto Raptors core. Scotty Barnes is really good. He's going to continue to get even better. But to think or even project and assume he's going to get good enough to the point where he's just going to be the one guy on the team that can constantly do things is asking a lot. Again, he when he was drafted, he was drafted as a guy as a developmental project where he was going to have to learn a lot of these things. And he's done it as a, at an accelerated rate. And that's awesome. But that can't be expected as a norm. So you, the Raptors see that, and they brought in complementary pieces in an RJ Barrett, in an Emmanuel Quickly. Why? Because they know they don't want Scotty Barnes to do everything. They want him to be really good at the things that he does, and they want these other guys to fill in the spots. That's why Emmanuel Quickly is brought in to be a lead guard. Like if, if Scotty Barnes was asked to be this point guard of the future, they wouldn't bring an Emmanuel Quickly in because that would be Scotty Barnes. So the reason they brought him in, the reason they brought RJ Barrett in to be that downhill runner and that bully is because they want them to be a core that works together, which is why like last night when everyone was like, Scotty has to take that shot. Scotty has to take that shot. I am like, give the shot to the person who's playing the best or give the shot to the guy who's manipulating the defense the most. Mm-hmm. Like if one night it's Emmanuel quickly and last night for a lot of it, it was him working out of that screen and roll with Jakob Pertl. He was great down the stretch there. He only had one turnover in that game. He was able to make dump off passes, make, got a lot of good looks for himself. He was really aggressive. So it's one of those things where like play through Emmanuel quickly then. It doesn't have to be Scotty Barnes just because he's quote unquote the guy. And then other nights, if it's RJ Baird or if it is Scotty Barnes because he's working really well down the stretch, like grow these guys together. Like when it comes to development, I don't think it should be like IQ developed just in this, Mm -hmm. RJ developed just in that, Scotty developed in this one spot. I think it has to be like develop these three guys together in as many situations as possible. And then you get that chemistry like you're talking about Kyle, where like, uh, IQ can give Scotty a nod and then he'll know what that means. Like that's going to happen when you put these guys in all these situations as many times as possible, because the fact of the matter is that these three guys are the core. This is what you're building for. It's not Scotty and other people are the, are kind of building around him. It's these three guys. And the team is building around that. That's what they did. That's what they've committed to for their future. Mm-hmm. So you need all of them involved. And that's why I think this idea of putting a hierarchy on them just doesn't make a ton of sense. Yeah, exactly. And like, are we forgetting like in the 2016 finals that, like, yeah, LeBron was definitively leading that team. But what did LeBron tell literally Coach Lou when that final shot happened? Let Kyrie take that shot. Not me. Let Kyrie take that shot. I mean, I think we can all agree that LeBron was the number one on the team. But he said, I want to give this ball to Kyrie because sometimes you got to know when to defer, when to give it to the other guys and who's cooking the most on that team. And Kyrie had the best shot of making that um, best shot at making that shot. So Again, we're not just going to put it all on Scotty. If Scotty saw, again, if Scotty saw what he saw out there and he said, okay, let me give this to Gary Trent because he would probably have the best chance at making this shot right now. We can't fault on him too much. He will learn going forward about what to do in these situations. If he can't get anything going, he'll make something happen. The team will learn. We just can't get on him right now. It's only the it's only the first month of this really new team we've, we've been yeah. seeing. It's, it hasn't been a year. It hasn't been months. It hasn't anything. And again, it will change. So... To kind of go in onto Twitter and just get down on the team after an OKC loss. Again, OKC is one of the best teams in the West right now. So the, the fact number one that, seed in the West, They're exactly the top team. Exactly, and the fact that we were competing with them like that should be a positive going into the future. Again, like yeah, we did kind of blow it in the second half, but it happens. Things like this happen. I'm not expecting them to come out and dominate OKC. Yeah, we got that dub, but in the long run, they will learn and get better. We just can't yeah. be harping on this team too much or harping on these players too much. Yeah, I think it's one of those things where, like, there has to be a lot of self-awareness with the situation. Mm -hmm. Yes, I understand being excited about Scotty Barnes and what he can be. And this team is banking a lot on the fact that Scotty Barnes is going to develop into a really good player. But I think, like, a a, a larger majority of the fan base also has to, like, uh, be reminded that, like, it's not just Scotty. This this franchise, this organization is banking on the core in terms of how they develop together. Why? Because they're being self-aware of the fact that Scotty Barnes is a really good player but he is not set up to do everything and nor should he be. Like I, I keep using the example of Giannis and the Bucks. Giannis is a really, really good player. Obviously he's a multiple time MVP, finals MVP, Hall of Famer at this point, And you know what he can do. But if the Bucks just said Giannis take the ball and do everything for us and just kind of try to win games, they weren't, they're not going to win a lot of games. There's a reason why 
at the end of games, Chris Middleton and before Drew Holiday were taking a lot of shots. There's an even bigger reason why they brought in Damian Lillard. Because at the end of game situations, when it comes to creating shots, Giannis isn't like he doesn't have the tools to do that necessarily as effectively as a guy like Damian Lillard can. So they know that they're being they, like the Bucks are self aware of that fact and they built around him to have mm-hmm. complementary pieces. So now it's like, hey, technically, is Giannis the 1A on that team? Absolutely. But when it comes into those situations, are you going to say Giannis is the guy you're going to give the ball to every time down the stretch in those clutch moments? Probably not. In some cases, you could even argue Damian Lillard's the 1A when it comes to the fourth quarter. So it's one of those things where they're self-aware of the situation, and I think the Raptors are as well. Now the fan base just needs to catch up to that a little bit where this team, yes, Scotty is the guy, and yes, he's going to be doing a lot of it. But when it comes to building around his strengths, you need to have those other guys there and creating that hierarchy amongst them isn't really going to do that as effectively as possible yeah even during the cl- even during the clutch like before the siakam trade or before anything i was like okay who can we definitively give this to like when the games come down to the wire because i don't know really about i don't know how to feel about siakam i don't know how these other guys are doing but now i'm like okay we not only do we have scotty but we have quickly we have rj gary trent's been going off in these last few stretch of games so now we have multiple options to go to in the clutch it shouldn't just be the raptors be like tuck your head down drive to the paint and do make something happen that's the kind of same pressure we put on lebron for making the right play and people get on him for making the right play like he he's not he's not going to do something crazy where he takes up a three in someone's face no you got to be making the right play and that's what team basketball is about okay that's why durant went to the warriors because it's whoever's open is taking that shot we need to de- they're developing a culture like that and i don't want to be forcing this kind of toxic nba mindset that he should just have drove to the paint over like three guys not kicked it out to anybody and try to make something happen because that just forces a toxic narrative and i don't want to be putting that on a 22 year old Look, there's like 10 guys at a given time in the NBA who you can say just, hey, or take, the, take the ball and make something happen who are going to be like more effective than not. Even them, mm-hmm. they're not going to make over half their shots. Most of them are probably going to miss. Like, there is like literally, I, I would say 10 or fewer guys in the NBA that can do that. So asking 22-year-old Scotty Barnes to figure that out and start doing that, I think is being a little unfair to him. Mm-hmm. And that's not to say he can't do that one day, but he's definitely not in that position yet. And I think it's smarter not to build this team around the idea of getting Scotty Barnes to do that. So I was okay with the way the game ended. I think it's more so just the fact that like you have to put him in advantage, uh, advantageous mm-hmm. situations. The coaching staff needs to create plays that are kind of doing more for the entire team, involving things a bit more. Like... Look at Mark Daniel and that coaching staff at the end of that OKC game and how they got that like uh, that play to tie it. I believe at the in, uh, at the end of regulation for Aaron Wiggins when he got that backdoor cut, mm-hmm. uh, they used uh, Shea Gilgis Alexander as gravity. They had him get, get all this attention and Aaron Wiggins kind of cut behind everyone and got an open pass for a layup. Like it's things like that where coaching staff is understanding how to use their team the best way possible. So SGA is that guy, but even they were like, no, we're not just going to give SGA the ball because he's the guy and we're going to want him to try to make something happen because they knew he's going to get a certain type of attention. So they ended up getting Aaron Wiggins to play. It's one of those things where like this entire team has to work together in terms of getting better. So that's not just Scotty. That's the coaching staff. That's the rest of the players. They have to figure out they're young, but this is one of those things where like, I think leaving this game in with a sense of like regret or doubt about a player is the wrong way to go about it i think developmentally they're doing the right things they're learning from it and they're only going to continue learning off of this game and i kind of wanted to touch on that a little bit uh, as well because there's another conversation that's happened throughout these past couple weeks because yes yesterday's game was really good in terms Mm -hmm. of it was competitive it was fun and it was one of those losses that may have felt easier to swallow but there was also a couple ugly losses in this region recent stretch (laughs) especially the one against houston where you just got bullied inside there was no defense and it just looked like there it was almost a no show on that end in terms of effort and a lot of fans a lot of people are saying well like how is that kind of a loss good for development how does that even mean anything like what are you taking out of this thing it's not wins and lessons in that case it's just wins and losses and that's not what we want and i think that's a a bit of an interesting topic and it's good that the past two games have been kind of opposite ends of that spectrum here where one it's like okay you kind of see what the positives you can take out from it but the other one just feels like a loss to a lot of people so i'm curious Mm -hmm. what you think do you think all losses are good for development or do you think it has to be just an okc type of loss for it to mean something no i think all losses are good good for development especially when you're developing this core like yeah we got we got the shit kicked out of us when it came to the houston rockets but look how they came back in the first half against okc so obviously they heard us obviously they learned something obviously they came back with energy so and if you look at the box score of that game too like scotty barnes had 28 4 and 7 Emmanuel quickly had 25, six and one. Like we have to look for the positives in these games. I know it's hard. And I know when you're getting beat down like that is it is like, okay, 
this team's not going anywhere and we're just quick to jump because i guess the raptors fan base is so used to kind of seeing success in these last few years like before tampa or whatever like we had the 2019 team we had like 2018 team 2016 like we were so used to at least being contending but now it's kind of like we got that whole new wave of like raptors fans in that 2019 run you got to stick with it you know there's going to be tough losses there's going to be horrible losses but you have to see the positives in every loss like grady dick gaining more confidence getting time out there playing getting shots up you know the team kind of still working together like some people were injured some people were out how do we fix this how do we go back but come back better and they did come back better against the first half against okc i think they were gassed against the second half but again they did hear us they did make adjustments so for me at least i think losses like i'm just gonna take them as lessons right now we lose we lose okay it's expected we're not trying to contend it is what it is look at the positives look who's going off that game look who's having nice games see what we can fix and move on to the next game i think it's an interesting take and i kind of like how you approach it because like a lot of fans and rightfully so to some degree were like well against houston it just there was no effort it wasn't the fact that they were losing it's the fact that it looks like they weren't totally there mm -hmm. in terms of effort and energy against that team and that's part of why they lost so badly but then like the way you approach it it, it wasn't in a vacuum you saw that the OKC was their response to the Houston game, where they showed a lot more effort yeah. defensively and all energy. And if they can build on that and create consistency off it, well, then there was your lesson right there from that Houston beatdown. So I kind of like the approach that this, it, again, this team is in such flux right now. There is so much volatility in terms of the roster. It's still not set because the trade deadline's a couple days away. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, a, it's, it's probably a healthier way to approach the rest of the season as like, this is the, the the end of what comes out of this is going to be the lessons and kind of the development. So if you look at it game by game, it's not going to feel like maybe they're learning a whole lot. But when you go into next season, after they've had the rest of these like three months together to kind of build chemistry, they've had the off season. That's probably where you're going to hopefully see the dividends of some of these tough losses and kind of what they learned out of it. So it's kind of maybe a better way to approach it in terms of the future outlook. So I like that. I like that way of approaching it, not looking at every game in a vacuum. And I think it's a good way to see this whole wins and less than situation. So I, I think that's a pretty good spot to end it. I know we talked a lot about kind of like what this team is going through now, but I think it's going to be even more interesting to kind of talk about the rest of the guys. Because Scotty's obviously important, RJ quickly, but there's a whole team to talk about which is a pretty good spot for us to transition into our power rankings now to see what's going on. All right, so this are, this is the power rankings for this week. So I didn't do the last two weeks. I just did the last week like with the OKC game and everything because I feel like they would just be changing way too much. And again, we want to go on a week-by-week -week basis. So for this week, I did Scotty Barnes at number one, number two, RJ Barrett, number three, Emmanuel Quickly, number four, Gary Trent Jr., number five, Jordan Wara, uh, number six, Dennis Schroeder. Number seven, Bruce Brown. Eight, Jakob Pertl. Nine, Thaddeus Young. Ten, Grady Dick. Eleven, Chris Boucher. Twelve, Jante Porter. Thirteen, Jalen McDaniel. Fourteen, Garrett Temple. And fifteen, Otto Porter Jr. So, Zolfi, do you got any questions for me? I got one for you, but that's going to be probably after player discussion. But let me hear it. What are you saying? Yeah, I, okay. I, I, I mentioned how I wanted to kind of focus on some of the other players uh, when I got to this part, but I'm very curious. You have RJ Barrett at two. As far as I remember, he's only played one game in this whole stretch of basketball. <laughs> so clearly you were very impressed by the game. He had a good game. He had 24 yep. points and he was getting downhill a lot, but I'm curious why he was so high on this after missing some time and playing just one mm. game. Bro, I was about to, I was considering putting him at one after <laughs> yesterday. I was considering putting him, but I knew, I know he was injured. But honestly, like the fact that he came into that game yesterday and we saw how much we missed him with OKC with his scoring, like not even just him hitting threes, the ability to get inside, to push the tempo immediately, his defense, it was from RJ Barrett at least. I, I love that a lot. I love to see how much the difference he makes. It's like night and day when he's on the team versus when he's not. Maybe I could have mo moved him lower, but for me at least just that okc game just showed me how valuable he is to the team i was honestly considering putting him at one <laughs> i was really considering putting him at one because that that performance impressed me so much yesterday but i can see putting guys like all the other guys like over him or maybe shifting him down maybe to like the four or five spot yeah. including the injuries but for me just that alone i was like you know what rj really is that guy he's him that osmosis yeah fueling him i don't know what it is but that osmos is doing something <laughs> hey man osmos is keeping him right that's all i know uh but look i I'm, I'm with you there and i think the thing i love about him most and i mentioned this yesterday as well is that 
he plays with so much intention and conviction like when he's dribbling when he's going downhill when he's passing all of it has a purpose to it he's never doing something just for the sake of doing it and i keep talking about this core three having to work together and develop together and i think part of that is learning from each other if scotty barnes and emmanuel quickly can learn to be aggressive from rj barrett that will be incredible that will be something that is a great thing to pick up from him because he shows so much willingness and force down the stretch he's not afraid of any of the moments and i think that's super important to this team like there's been all this conversation about dogs and do the raptors have any dogs and rj barrett is a dog like this guy mm-hmm. loves to get downhill he loves to bully he loves to use his physicality and that's something that uh, uh scotty barnes can look at and be like i can do that because he obviously has the physical tools to do it so if he can take some of those lessons from uh, rj barrett i think it'll mean a lot and i think that's added value to what rj barrett's doing outside of just you know playing awesome like he is like, I'll say it, he's all-star caliber playing right now. And who knows if that keeps up over a full season with this team. But right now, he's averaging over 20 points, career high in rebounds. He's doing mm-hmm. really well moving the ball as well. So I think he's done everything he could ask for in Denzel. So I'm really glad to see him back and hopefully he can stay healthy down the stretch. And uh, going off of that, some of the other players I wanted to touch on, I see Bruce Brown has dropped for you. And I'm really interested to hear about Bruce Brown because it's weird. He may not be on this team. In fact, it's likely he won't be on this team (laughs) after the trade deadline. But I don't think this recent stretch of games is really helping his value. People are saying you have to put him out there to showcase him. But he's kind of been tunnel vision for a lot of these uh, games, Mm -hmm. especially the last two. Just getting downhill, not really looking, moving the ball a ton. When he is moving the ball and doing what you know what Bruce Brown does, he looks pretty good out there. But there's a ton of moments where it's like, Bruce, why are you taking these shots and kind of commandeering the offense? I'm curious, like, mm-hmm. if that's where you're, this is coming from and what your thoughts are for him kind of pre-trade deadline. Yeah, so, like, if this was, like, the first, like, because the last two weeks, if this was that first week, he probably would have been a bit higher. But I was just taking in these last four games, and especially with the game yesterday, too, it's like, I was literally going to write, did Bruce's controller die or something? Like, what was he doing? Was he not getting car? He's just out there running, bro. He was getting cardio because I don't know if he's, I don't know if he's checked out because he knows he's not going to be with the the team long term. So he's kind of just doing whatever. I don't know if he's, the trade rumors are kind of bothering him where he's like, okay, like, what's the point? But yesterday, what I saw was he, again, the tunnel vision, he wasn't making the right plays. He just, I don't know what he was doing out there so i had to move him lower because honestly it was just like okay you're just out here kind of messing up the offense that's what kind of bothered me too because as soon as you see bruce brown moving like this why didn't darko sub in wara like immediately as soon as you saw th- this nonsense happening get war in the game he's been good to us that's why i moved him up to five he's been really great for the team so it was questionable and as soon as i saw his energy like that i don't know like it kind of yeah i had to draw i had to drop him down yeah, it's interesting because, again, like this idea of auditioning a player so they can maybe squeeze out an extra pick in a trade, mm-hmm. I, in theory, can make sense. But when the guy's coming out of here and looking like that, I don't really think it makes a ton of sense. Yeah. And also, again, it goes back to self-awareness. And I mentioned this as well yesterday. We're like, how are you meant to showcase a player who's supposed to be good around talented like pieces and connecting them all when your team doesn't have a lot of talented pieces? Like uh, I was talking to another, I was talking to Sheldon Alexander with Canada Hoops Daily yesterday, and he mentioned like, "Hey, Bruce Brown will look a lot different next to Nikola Jokic and Jamal Murray than he will with uh, Scotty Barnes, Gary Trent Jr., mm-hmm. and those guys." Like, and it's the truth. Like, it's just once Bruce Brown is around talented players, showcase him all you want because he's gonna fit in really well. But when he's not on a team that talented, I don't think the whole showcasing idea works that great. So I'm curious to see what kind of value the Raptors get from him moving forward. I'm sure most of the league still just knows what kind of player Bruce Brown is. Uh, but you also mentioned like maybe put it, benching him for Jordan Wara. And I'm curious mm-hmm. because uh, shout out to Samson Folk on Raptors Republic here. He had a piece that came out not that long ago about the gunner role and this kind of like the catch and shoot three point shooter and how the Raptors have like three different iterations of that on this team. You have Gary Trent Jr. who you have your four, Jordan Wara right under him at five. And then Grady Dick who's a bit further down. And I'm kind of curious from you to kind of get what your impressions are of that gunner role for Toronto now and moving in the future. Obviously, Gary Trent Jr. is coming up on uh, free agency. Jordan War is going to be a free agent as well. But he's probably, if you're trying to replace Gary, a cheaper, more polished option at the current point in time in terms of what you can get. But then you also have the developmental side of it is like this team maybe doesn't want to focus on a cheaper, polished option. They just want to get Grady those reps and move forward. But to kind of go back, Gary Trent Jr. is probably the best of these three guys, currently Mm -hmm. speaking. He's shooting lights out from three right now, especially on catch and shoot threes. And he's kind of having a bit of resurgence after that struggling start to the season. So you have three options here in three very different ways. I'm curious, in terms of that gunner role, what do you see for this Raptors team? 
for me, if I'm the Raptors at least, and like I know Gary Trent's playing out of his mind, and when I say to move him, it's not because he's a bad player, it's just because I feel like he's playing so well right now that contenders will want him and bring more value to the Raptors. So I say you can keep Nora as that gunner role for now and then still kind of develop Grady into that because it's a cheaper option. I like I like his game as well too. Not hating on Gary Trent either, but I feel like he can fit with this core going into the future too as well and then helping Grady take off the bench. But, you know, like, just speaking of these players, too, I wanted to ask you, like, move, switching subjects a little bit. Dennis Schroeder, after that game, he was negative 23. Um, it was it was, it was kind of weird because there are points in the game where I'm like, okay, he's hooping and he's drawing fouls. But then there's other points where he looked at RJ Barrett open in the corner and he just waved him off. Or he's on defense and I, he, he's just falling asleep. And you guys got, you got, got guys, like, open for three, hitting the shot. So... I want to know what do you think the team should do with Dennis Schroeder going forward? Do you think it's time to move on or do you think we're just kind of jumping the gun here? Look, I think there's like two ways to answer this one. Like obviously if there's value there and you can get something that you want out of him, either in a young player or some kind of expiring deal. So open up cap space, be it assets, picks, whatever, like you have to consider it obviously, but to the people who want to trade Dennis away because he hasn't really fit in or he's not doing what you want him to do. I ask, What's your other option after it? Hmm. You trade him away. What are you going to do? Call up Marquise Noel or Javon Freeman Liberty from the 905? Where are you going to get a backup point guard? I don't really see a backup point guard on this team right now. Like, mm -hmm. I don't know. Does anybody else have an answer? I don't think they do. Because after Dennis Schroeder, what really is there in terms of a backup point guard? So, the pro the th not the problem. The thing with Dennis lately that I've noticed is like he's not being that like floor general type of Dennis yeah. when he was a starter. He's being, a, I was a, almost six men of the year a couple of seasons ago, being that Dennis, where he's trying to be more of a scorer, looking for his own shot, kind of creating that way rather than facilitating. And some of it might be that this bench unit isn't the most impressive. There's no consistency there with the bench. Sometimes Bruce Brown's starting, sometimes he's not. Mm -hmm. Guys are moving up and down and there's no continuity. So it's hard to be a facilitator in that. So I'm sure those things are playing a role into it. But I'm not against the idea of trading Dennis if the value is there. Obviously, he's not a long-term part of this core in terms of growing, and he's only on a two-year deal. So I don't I don't really hate the idea of trading Dennis if, the, if you get good value for him. My thing is, it's like, if you trade him, you're out of a backup point guard. Unless yep. you bring up one of those guys from the 905 or just sign somebody in a buyout, or you get one back in a trade, but I don't know how likely that is. So that situation is going to get really interesting after that if that's what you do. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like you, you immediately trade him away. Like I'm not one to hop on the let's trade Dennis trade because again, I I was watching all these games to start of the season. We're watching all these games. We saw what he could do. We saw him slow down the game, run the pick and roll with Jacoperto. Get he was hooping to start of the season, and everyone was like, "Yo, Dennis is great. Dennis is amazing for this team. Dennis is fantastic." But now that he's having these stretch a few games, we're turning on him so quickly. But I feel just like okay. Let's see what the team looks like. Don't move him. Let's see what the team looks like after the trade deadline when we're kind of set with a set roster. See what he can do off the bench. Other teams will probably want him going forward too. Even if there is, the only way I, I agree with you, the only way we should move him is if there's value there. If teams, if contending teams want him and will give up good pieces for the Raptors going forward, then yes. But again, too, I feel like he's still kind of figuring out how to manage coming off the bench because again he was hooping in these last two weeks but that's because again like emmanuel quickly was injured so he had to kind of regain that starting role yeah he, he got like 10 14 assists in some game so it's there his talent is there it's just i think he's kind of struggling with coming off the bench right now just figuring out how to fit in this because even though he's coming off the bench he is playing starter minutes sometimes yeah, so he's closing games at times exactly too. So we still got to figure it figure it out. And I think the Raptors are still figuring out how to implement him off the bench too as well because it was easier to implement him in the starters, kind of like with Gary Trent Jr. Like he's doing better with the starters than he was off the bench. So maybe it's kind of just the same thing for Dennis, but I don't think we should be coming down on him and being like, trade him, trade him now. Like only if the value is there. Yeah, I think, I think the interesting part too is and like a bit of an underrated aspect of it is like, Dennis is a veteran in this league and say what you mm -hmm. want about what his career has been. He's had some really good stretches and he's, he stayed in this league for quite some time and he's been offered really big deals. Obviously it didn't work out for him in that contract situation, but he's been a guy that teams have sought after for a while. And that's a, that's a, a good bet to have for a young team, especially for an Emmanuel quickly to kind of like get some tutelage from, and maybe your people are saying like, well, I don't want Emmanuel quickly to learn from a guy like this because of how he plays and stuff. But I, I, I would push back on that sense that like Dennis has been a floor general. He's been a leader in a lot of different situations. He's been a starter. He's come off mm. the bench. He's done that just in his time in Toronto, but he's done that throughout his whole career. 
And having a vet like that for uh, Emmanuel quickly to learn from, I think is super important because they play similar styles of game too. They use their change of pace. They use their like outside shot to kind of be a bit of a threat at times. Obviously not the most knockdown shooters all the time, but they have similar styles in that sense. So I kind of like it in terms of how they play it. Same thing with like, how what a Thad Young offers to Scotty Barnes. Having those vets behind them that kind of have similar builds and style to their play, I think makes a difference because they kind of mm -hmm. see how they can envision their careers looking at those guys. So I think that's an underrated part of it. So if you're not gonna, if you're just gonna get a second round pick out of Dennis Schroeder, yeah. I don't really see the point of trading him. I think I'd rather uh, let it ride out at least into the off season and kind of reevaluate from there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, same too. Like two things I want to address too. Like I was in a Raptors spaces last night with the Raptors fans. It's a uh, number one. It's comedy. It's just comedy to hear I, them. I, just... Before before <laughs> you go, I'm sorry. I'm gonna get so much hate for this, but I don't care. I have to say it. I think like Twitter spaces is for the lowest common denominator of people. <laughs> yeah, I just it's... I am not a like Twitter spaces and like all these community spaces <laughs> just sound like it's the dumbest people saying the dumbest things, just crying and whining for no reason. It's Bro, like it's. It it's like the Jersey insane. Shore of like basketball. <laughs> Raptors talk. fan. It's like the Stan accounts, but the stuff I was hearing last night, and I'm gonna send you a clip after this too, is literally ridiculous. Like I'm hearing them talk about this game, and they were saying that they don't want Emmanuel quickly as their point guard, like in the future. So Do you have other options? Is there other options that I'm aware of that the Raptors are just gonna have? They don't want Emmanuel quickly going forward, like. Huh? Is this, <laughs> it's this whole like oh scotty barnes has to be the point guard and i mentioned this today and i mentioned this yesterday why do people want scotty barnes to be a point guard? exactly he is, he, <laughs> he is not the the lebron james magic johnson ben simmons type of build where he's an elite dribbler and can create from that space he is a strong tall big body again i say similar to Giannis. stop making scotty barnes a point guard he, can he be a passer? Can he be a facilitator that you run through? Yes, but he is not a face the basket point guard thing. Mm -hmm. And I think that's so dumb. Like Emmanuel quickly is an elite pick and roll player. I think he can work well. Having Scotty Barnes be a facilitator is one thing. Having him be a point guard, you need to really understand what it means to be a point guard. And it, it, people saying that Scotty Barnes should be that, I think don't completely understand what being a point guard is. Exactly. Like, yeah, did Emmanuel quickly struggle for those first three quarters? Yeah, he had five points, but he also had eight assists. Yeah. So he's he's the point guard of the team. I want him going forward. I love his game and what he brings to this team. Just because we see guys like Luka, LeBron, these are once in a lifetime players. Okay. Yeah. These are generational players. We can't expect every six nine player to be a point guard, to be versatile. And you know, it's okay. Scotty doesn't need to be a point guard when we have a manual quickly. When we have other guards on the team, we don't need to force him into be something he's not. So for these Raptors fans to say that and come down on him is insane to me. And then the second thing too. So if we were to move Dennis Schroeder, and I know like you're like saying we might need, need a backup guard or anything. What about our Lowry reunion for veteran leadership? Look, if Lowry was willing to come back, I would want him in a heartbeat just to be that veteran to hold these guys accountable to kind mm -hmm. of like, I don't want to say whip players into shape, but to kind of like kind of steer them in the right direction. I would love it. I don't think Lowry personally would want that. Mm -hmm. He If he goes on like a vet minimum type of deal, he probably wants to be contending, making a deep playoff run. I like the idea of him joining like either a New York or a M2 Philly. Series. And uh, yeah, I, and I know it sucks to say Philly because obviously most Raptors, fans, <laughs> including myself, don't like Philly a whole lot. But I think uh, it's one of those things where he would just fit in perfectly with that team. They're looking for a bit of backup guard depth. And they're one of the few com contending teams that can add him because any team that would go over the second apron can add Kyle Lowry. So that kind of eliminates some of the top contending options. So yeah, like if it's one of the things if Lowry was down for it, yes but i would really really think if lowry agreed to that it'd be him saying this is my swan song i'm ready to say goodbye to the game after this which i personally don't think lowry is at a point to do yet so if, if i'm predicting it no i don't think that happens but if i if you're asking like do i like the idea absolutely he could be mm -hmm. holding this team accountable he can kind of fit in he'll get more minutes like he wants but he would just have to be accepting the fact that this team isn't really going to be contending down the stretch that's for sure yeah i feel like if we were to trade dennis and they were to bring in lowry um, I feel like he has to come in with the idea knowing that this team isn't going anywhere and that he's like simply here just to help mentor yeah. these guys and lead these guys and kind of guard or like mentor the next era of Raptors basketball. And that's why I would want him here. But as a Lowry fan, I want to see him succeed. So him to go anywhere else that's contending, I wouldn't be opposed to that either. But yeah, like I don't know if you have any other yeah. comments about the... <laughs> I would, I, 
I will say <laughs> that if Lowry does come, God pray for Darko Ryakovich because he's already faced enough allegations <laughs> against Garrett Temple being the coach of this team. If Kyle Lowry <laughs> shows up, then they're basically going to be demoting Darko Ryakovich to assistant coach, which will be kind of, it'll be funny, but obviously really unfortunate because the memes are going to be insane at that point. Because yeah, again, already Garrett Temple in his stylish suits looks like he's the coach of the team at times. And then if you bring Kyle Lowry, who will absolutely look like the coach of the team, Darko's mm-hmm. gonna Darko's gonna have a tough time. So hopefully that that's not how that goes if Lowry does come. But you never know. <laughs> uh, but yeah, last thing I wanted to mention again: uh, Twitter Spaces. Please stop going to that for any insightful comments Bro, about like, basketball analysis. It, it, I just don't think it, it exists was there. Crazy the stuff I was hearing yesterday. They were saying Scotty can't close games. Some guy just went on a. Te- they were just going on a tangent. It did some, Bro, I, I swear ten- somebody cried while talking yeah. about the end of that game. Yeah. Also. Well, there's, there's, a reason, <laughs> there's a reason why half these accounts that are on like Twitter spaces are blocked by players because they, they don't exactly. really provide anything insightful. Exactly. Scotty, Scotty's blocking people. RJ's blocking people. There, I heard a baby crying. I heard people <laughs> screaming. I heard somebody's mom came into the spaces and oh was talking God. about it. They were getting down. They're saying this loss is on Darko quickly and Scotty. They were, it just doesn't make any sense. Because you have people saying they want to win now, and then you have people going like with the rebuilding type of side, and it, the takes are just these are Skip Bayless level takes, bro. The amount of the amount of hates I see, I don't know. It, it's it's not good. <laughs> look, look, I'll say this, and I know if if anybody is paying attention to this from the Twitter Spaces community or whatever the heck they, they want to call it, like go go ahead and like give me crap for it. I don't care. Mm. What what the last point I'll make on this? It's usually the loudest voices are often the wrongest so mm-hmm. the twitter spaces community that likes to yell and cry and say all this stuff are louder than just about anyone else but again i i don't usually take a lot of stock in what's coming out of those conversations but that's just me but uh yeah, yeah I'll, I'll leave it at that come at me <laughs> hate all you want let us know what you think about kyle's power rankings did you agree disagree do you like twitter spaces i i don't care if you do but go ahead and let us know <laughs> either way uh but yeah we're gonna move on to our next topic now Okay, so welcome to Betting Ahead, powered by FanDuel. So again, so I'm going to be looking by ahead at the schedule for next week who the Raptors play. So in our last segment of Betting Ahead, the Raptors had the Grizzlies, the Clippers, and the Hawks for that week. And I said to take the Raptors' money line on the Grizzlies and the Hawks and that the Raptors would lose to the Clippers. And what were the results? You might want to invite the Raptors to my funeral so they can let me down one more time because they lost all three of those games. Anyways, this upcoming week, the Raptors have the Pelicans, the Hornets, the Rockets, and the Cavs. Kind of a difficult schedule, but they do have one or two kind of easier games in there. So with the way the team is going right now, it's kind of very volatile to pick. But I don't think they have enough to take down the Pelicans. The Hornets shouldn't be too much of a challenge, and I pray to God they win this one. But after last week's blowout against Houston, I know they want to come back with sort of revenge type game chip off the shoulder. So I think they'll take it against Houston. And the Cavs have been rolling as of late. So I think that momentum will carry them right past Toronto. So I would say to take the money line against the Hornets and the Rockets if you're supporting Toronto. Now let's get to our Raptors 10K 10 week challenge. So last time on Betting Head, when we started the new 10K challenge, I chose the Hawks game for this parlay. And what happened? Like I said to do where Scotty 15 plus points, RJ 15 plus points, Scotty 4 plus assists. Other likes to consider was quickly over 1.53s and RJ 4 plus rebounds. So technically we did win this parlay. Just RJ and quickly were out with injury. So those legs would have been voided. So I'm just going to chalk this up as a W. A W is a W. I'll take it however we got. We probably got did get less money on that. Anyways, let's move on to the week two of the challenge. I feel like the Raptors are due for a huge bounce back game, especially against the OKC last night. So I'm going to do against the Pelicans. The legs I would do is RJ 20 plus points. The way he's been rolling with the scoring, this should be too, uh, super light for him. Scotty 15 plus points as well. Again, Scotty is not going to be a huge score, but he does manage to hit that 15 plus every time. Quickly, four plus assists. Like I said, even though he struggled with scoring last night, he did have eight assists in the first three quarters, so that shouldn't be too much of a sweat. Other legs to consider is Scotty one plus three, quickly one plus three, and quickly 15 plus points. I don't think quickly would keep struggling the way he did last night against OKC. So that is what I would do for the second week of the 10K 10 week challenge. And that's all you have this week for betting ahead, powered by FanDuel. All right, thank you, Kyle. Now that does it for us. We want to thank anyone who followed along. Hope you're caught up on all things Raptors. If you'd like this and want more content for Raptors Republic, check out the description or go to raptorsrepublic.com. 
The trade deadline is a couple of days away. It's a good time to keep up to date on all things Raptors with us. But better yet, why not come out to Rivoli on Tuesday, February 6th? That's right, Raptors Republic pre-trade deadline live podcast. It's the place to be on Tuesday. Folks like Louis Zatzman, Samson Folk, S. Barahaney, Blake Murphy will be on stage talking about the Raptors, answering questions, and just leading some fun conversations. There will also be a bunch of other special guests and speakers. You can take part of that all for $15, which includes a drink as well, if that's up for you. And uh, so come out, meet us. Kyle and I will both be there. But there's, like I said, there's going to be a lot of cool talkers and speakers. So have fun, and you get to talk about all things Raptors. Again, all the details will be at raptorsrepublic.com. That's on Tuesday, February 6th. So please come out and have some fun pre-trade deadline. Who knows what can happen? Maybe we get a live trade while we're talking that night. That'll be crazy. I'm sure the crowd will go insane. But with that being said, please like, share, and subscribe. But even more, please comment and give us your feedback with Run It Back. Let us know what you think. Do we want to, what, what can we improve on? What can we get better at? We always want to know your feedback. Let me know what you think about Twitter spaces. Again, come at me if you think I, I, I'm in the minority there. But that pretty much does it for us. I'm Zofi Shake, joined by Kyle Ramnarine on the Raptors Republic Network. We'll see you next week where we run it back.